Welcome back to The Daily Poem here on the Close Reads Podcast Network. I'm David Kern. Today is Tuesday, April 21st, 2020. And today I want to share with you um, a, a few paragraphs from a book that I really love. It's called Why Poetry. It came out a couple of years ago, uh, and it's by Matthew Zapruder. And at the very end of the book, he has an afterword. And the name of this afterword is called Poetry and Poets in a Time of Crisis. And I was uh, reviewing this book uh, for another podcast that I was participating in and came across a couple of paragraphs that I wanted to share with you here on this podcast. So today I'm going to do something a little bit different. We, of course, are, are living in um, a time of crisis right now with the uh, coronavirus, with COVID-19 impacting all of our lives. And so I, th- I thought that the comments that uh, Mr. Zapruder includes in this section are worth sharing with you. So if you can get your hands on this book, I recommend you do so. You can get it on Amazon, bookshop.org, any, any booksellers. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read this whole section. I'm just going to jump around a little bit. But again, this is a little bit different today, but I wanted to share it with you. Zapruder writes, quote, I'm a poet, which means that my areas of expertise and concern are language and the imagination. I feel certain it is essential to ask, what does this crisis mean for poets and poetry? What in these times must we do? Can poetry help save us? Um, as an aside here, um, he's writing this a couple of years ago, as I said, but I think this applies. He's writing more generally about crises, uh, cultural crises, but this one apply, it applies here in this specific instance as well. He goes on, I've always believed that poetry has its own special role, distinct from all other uses of language. I agree with W.S. Merwin when he writes, quote, poetry like speech itself is made out of paradox, contradictions, irresolvables. It cannot be conscripted even into the service of good intentions. End quote. Zapruder goes on. It may very well be that we have entered another time when most poets will feel compelled to use poetry to stop things from happening. Yet I believe that even if poetry did not do this, it would be vital to our survival. It has always seemed to me that if you want to convince someone to act in a certain way or to explain why something is right and something else is wrong, prose is far better than poetry. Poems, of course, at times convince, explain, advocate, argue, but in the end they are ultimately interested in something else. We could call that something else beauty or the possibilities of language or maybe just freedom. It is something that has to do with the allowing the mind to be completely, almost anarchically interested in the freedom to explore the possibilities of the material of language itself. This is what makes poems an undependable vehicle for advocacy. The poem is easily distracted. It wanders away from the demonstration, the committee meeting, the courtroom, toward the lake, or that intriguing, mysterious light over there. What is that light? It looks like something. I'm not sure what. I'm sorry to leave this very important conversation, but I have to know. This wandering, though, is not a mere luxury or privilege. It has an essential purpose. In Wallace Stevens' essay, The Noble Rider and the Sounds of Words, he makes the argument that poetry is a place where we can preserve our imaginations and resist the pressure of the real. That is the incessant drumming in of information, of news, of terrible events and realities. If we do not do so, he argues, we lose something essential to our humanity our imagination. Stevens wrote his essay on the eve of the entry of the United States into World War II when the news was pressing down on everyone. The drumming of information he was identifying was, has become immeasurably louder. Sometimes I feel like I can't hear anything else. Sometimes it seems to me that unless I turn off all the electronics in my immediate vicinity, I will be surrounded by a kind of existential buzzing, a deafening sound composed of everyone's thoughts, opinions, commentaries, clever jokes, contradictory certainties, intense worries, greatless fears. That all this loudness takes place in language seems to be of special concern to me as a poet, since my artistic work depends on freedom and lightness, but also serious attention to the same language. To be continually surrounded by language used exclusively for utilitarian purposes is a threat to the disinterested yet sacred attention a poet must have to words. Also, poetry has an intimate, necessary relation with silence. The work of a poet is impaired by too much noise and language, a scarcity of silence. This communication over time has become not only intolerable to me personally, but also a matter of immediate wider concern. The pressure of the real is everywhere. It's completely understandable grief and fear and freaking out, and also community and necessary information. Some find solace in social media and elsewhere. That really does make sense. 
networks will surely be a source of action and resistance. We need to know what's happening. But there's a point where it becomes too much. A kind of roar of opinions and fears that do not truly stir us to action or make us more aware. There is a danger to unfettered catastrophizing, which will sap our energy and distract and drain us. On social media and elsewhere, our attention has been monetized, not figuratively, but literally, to a personally and societally harmful degree. When Stevens discusses the pressure of the real, he talks about it as a violence done to our very selves. He writes that poetry is the way we can resist that pressure, that violence, not in order to avoid the real, but in order to preserve within ourselves the necessary space of imagination, possibility, humanity, love, a space that can help us live our lives. Poetry, because it is ultimately undistracted by whatever uses to which language is otherwise devoted, telling stories, arguing or convincing or informing, buying and selling, preaching, condemning, and so on, has a unique role in the preservation of an imaginative space. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Poets, according to Stevens, help us live our lives not by telling us what to think or by comforting us. They do so by creating spaces where one individual imagination can activate another, and those imaginations can be together. Poems are imaginative structures built out of words, one that any reader can enter. They are places of freedom, enlivenment, true communion. One could say correctly that this is true of any form of literature, or really any use of language, but because poetry remains free of all the other obligations that any other use of language inevitably must take on, it can be devoted purely to the creation of these spaces, where one imagination in the company of another can remember what it is to be alive and free. The creation of these imaginative spaces is a necessary work. Skipping ahead a little bit again. The role of poetry in our time of crisis is the same as always, to preserve our minds and language so we may be strong for whatever is to come, and also to preserve the possibility of mutual understanding, not by arguing for it, but by demonstrating it. Skipping ahead again, Zapruder says, I ended a class by reading one of my favorite poems by Frank O'Hara called A True Account of Talking to the Sun on Fire Island. In the poem, the sun comes to O'Hara early in the morning. The son first approaches the poet for not being awake when he comes, and then gives him some encouragement with a bad pun on his first name. Frankly, I wanted to tell you, I like your poetry. I see a lot on my rounds, and you're okay. You may not be the greatest thing on earth, but you're different. My class full of aspiring poets laughed. The son goes on to tell the poet he should look up more often, and to always embrace things, people, earth, sky stars, as I do, freely and with the appropriate sense of space. Zapruder says, I almost never cry, but I got choked up, just as I do every single time I read this poem. Because even though O'Hara died at the age of 40, after being hit by a jeep on the beach at Fire Island a year before I was born, I love him, and I am sure I know him. The poem ends, Son, don't go. I was awake at last. No, go I must, they're calling me. Who are they? Rising, he said. Someday you'll know. They're calling to you too. Darkly he rose, and then I slept. They're calling to you too in poems. Someday you'll know. This is the promise of poetry in this time of crisis and beyond. Again, I recommend you get this book, Why Poetry by Matthew Zapruder. It's from HarperCollins. It came out a couple of years ago, and you can get it wherever books are sold. This has been The Daily Poem. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back tomorrow with another poem for you.